Okay, I think we can get this started. Um, thank you everyone for joining uh, this World Wide Web Foundation panel discussion on Web3 technologies. My name is Van Ventley. I'm on the policy team here at the Web Foundation. Um, if you're not familiar with our organization, we were founded by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, uh, with a vision of a web that is free, open, and fair for everyone. Uh, in our policy work here at the Web Foundation, we've been hearing a lot about uh, Web3 technologies. Um, we've been hearing a lot of discussion that Web3 is the, the future of the web. Uh, we hear that it'll make the web more decentralized, more democratized. Um, technologies associated with Web3, things like cryptocurrencies, blockchain, NFTs, that's non-fungible tokens, smart contracts, um, they seem to be all over the news, or at least the tech news. Um, but the conversation, not everyone agrees with this. Uh, some people say this is the future of the web. Others say that it is a marketing ploy or a Ponzi scheme. Um, at the Web Foundation, we believe everyone should have access to a safe and empowering web. So we really wanted to understand more about, uh, about these technologies and what they might mean for the future of the web. Uh, when you all registered for this event, um, you answered some survey questions. I have uh, looked over some of those responses. Um, we got a really interesting uh, diversity of responses about your familiarity with Web3 technologies. Some of you said you're very familiar with Web3, others said not familiar at all. Um, but the most common response by far, I would say the large majority of you said that you are somewhat familiar with Web3 technologies. So I think this conversation is going to be really useful to you all. We won't be able to answer every question about Web3 technologies. It's a very broad topic and we only have one hour. Um, I think the goal is to um, clarify some of the big concepts in Web3. Um, I think we wanna hear from our great panelists about what some of the opportunities and risks are um, with regard to Web3 and the future of the web. Um, so now I will uh, take a moment uh, to let each of our wonderful panelists introduce themselves, um, tell us who they are and a little bit about their backgrounds. Uh, so I will start uh, with Mr. Tom Lamin. Okay, hi everyone. So I'm Tom Bashiku Lamin and I'm a Cyrillian American based in New York. I professionally, I consider myself a technology architect. So very similar to a civil engineer architect, I build blueprints for uh, computer systems or for technology systems. In addition to that, I'm actually an investor in uh, real estate, eco-friendly real estate, and also an avid contributor to open source and uh, civic tech. Thank you, glad to be here. Great, next, uh, next is Clev Mesador. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation. I'm Clev Mesador. I am the executive director for the Blockchain Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit focused on education. It is an industry-wide education campaign. For the last three years, I've been an advisor to the Blockchain Association, which is the largest advocacy group for the industry in Washington. They represent over 90 companies in the industry. Previously, I served in Congress for two members and I was an Obama presidential appointee. And I worked at the Economic Development Administration, which actually really honed in this whole intersection of innovation, entrepreneurship, and crypto for me. I'm, I, I also lead the National Policy Network of Women of Color in blockchain, because I do believe that we have to be intentional and, and, and invest in inclusion as we actually build the architecture for the crypto ecosystem. Thank you, Claude. Um, next, we have our own Web Foundation Zone, Nina Nwakanma. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I thought Tom was going before me. So we've had two people, um, Claire and myself, we share three things in common. We are women of color. You can see that. And we love uh, education and we love mobilizing people. 
That's what I share with Claire. Tamba is an African. Tamba, I've just finished building a house. So I'm not a real, I'm not as big as real estate. I'm just a landlord. That's what they call it, landlady in Africa. Uh, and I'm an open source uh, enthusiast. Everything about me is open source, open data, open tech. And that's how I got to open web. I work as the chief web advocate at the World Wide Web Foundation. So Van is my boss, kind of. I do the stuff he wants me to do. I say the stuff he wants me to say. And I try to, to not make any, too much trouble. So if, if I go too far into trouble, please call me back, ping me uh, privately on, on the chat. Because I don't like these crypto guys. I'm not sure exactly what they are saying. Their language is, is it architecture? Is it financing? Especially Tamba, I, I'm coming for you. I don't understand exactly what they are saying. So I'm here to make sure those of us, I'm here to represent all your participants. Eh? I'm a panelist, but my role is to represent all of you. So let's shoot, let's ask the questions, let's get them to commit to something and let's understand exactly what it is. I don't know why even Van titled it is Web3, the future of the web. What do you mean future of the web? The web has always been there. It's growing every day. What is like, when it's future in the web? When was it past? When is it present? Anyway, let me stop so far. My name is Nena. I come from the internet, I'm here to make less trouble than I planned. Thank you. Thank you, Nena. Uh, and I am definitely not Nena's boss. Nena is my boss. Nena is all of our bosses. So uh, <laughs> uh, next we have Mr. Tamika Tillman. Thank you, pleasure to be with you. And uh, Nena, I hope we can cause some good trouble today. I think that should be the goal of this panel. Um, I, I am the Chief Policy Officer of Han Ventures. We are a brand new venture capital fund dedicated to building a better internet. Uh, along with Katie Han, who is our general partner, uh, I and many of our team members came from Andreessen Horowitz, uh, the, the venture capital fund. Previously, I served as an advisor to Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, and John Kerry. Uh, and I spent many years in civil society working to help democratic institutions harness the power and benefits of open source and decentralized technologies. Certainly looking forward to our conversation today. Great, thank you all. Um, I wanna take a moment to just point out that um, the chat is open and later on in the session, we will be uh, taking questions for the panelists. So as you listen uh, to what our panelists have to say, um, if you have questions, please drop those in the chat and we will um, get to those later on in, in the session. Uh, so I'll start with our, our first question. As I said in the intro, um, this is going to be a kind of broad introduction to some Web3 uh, concepts. So I'd really like to get a sense from each of the panelists where you see the landscape of Web3 technology, technologies today. Um, and I'd like to hear kind of an optimistic version, what you think the, the big opportunities are um, of how these uh, Web3 technologies are developing today, as well as your more pessimistic version. What are the risks that we need to be considering? Um, where do you think the technologies might be overhyped? Uh, so that's the first question. Broad landscape, what's the best case scenario and what is, what is the risky scenario? Um, and we can go in reverse order of what we just did. So I'll start with Tamika. Thanks very much. Um, well, I think that this is a, a big and important set of questions, Van. Uh, let me start, if I can, with the pessimistic scenarios, because I think it's important to, to get some of those on the table at the outset. Right now, if you are a human on planet Earth who wants to use technology, you really only have two paradigms available to you. One is an authoritarian paradigm that's emanating out of places like Beijing and Moscow, uh, in which personal information is aggregated and used to manipulate behavior for political purposes. The other is a big tech paradigm that's emanating primarily out of places like Silicon Valley and Seattle, in which personal information is aggregated and used to manipulate behavior for commercial purposes. Neither one of those frameworks is compatible with a healthy open society predicated on the idea that people should be able to make their own independent informed decisions. 
And so we really need something better. Uh, Web3 should provide that alternative. I, I think the pessimistic scenario in my mind is that we continue on our current trajectory or that we end up with some version of Web3 that just perpetuates the neo-feudal oligarchic system that we're stuck in right now. The optimistic scenario is that we're able to create platforms that give individuals much greater control over their information, much greater ownership of the platforms and the digital services that they rely on every day, and a much bigger say in how those digital services and platforms are governed. We end up with a much more democratized uh, version of the internet that provides far more people with much greater access to opportunity. Uh, that I think should be our goal. We have a toolbox that is really a, a toolbox with unprecedented power to help us achieve that goal. Uh, and hopefully the objective for this panel and all of us who are working in this space is to move us a little bit closer uh, to that destination. Great, thank you, Tamega. Um, Nena, do you wanna go next? Thank you very much. Like I said, I'm here to ask questions. And I listen to Tamika very well. When, when people, when I hear about Web3, uh, blockchain, and the first thing that comes to mind for me is open source, peer-to-peer -peer technology, security, encryption, and a greater desire for freedom. Now, we, whether, wherever we apply it, whether it's in art or in finance, we're going to come to that later. I have a few reflections. Please cut me if it goes too far. I have just told everyone that I live in West Africa. I live, I live in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire. I'm in Nigeria. This is a place where electricity can be cut off anytime. So the possibility that I can mine Bitcoin in this city is very limited, or anywhere in West Africa for that matter. Fiber to the house, broadband internet access is limited to a very few percentage of the population. Believe you me, there are still people in this country who are not connected to the internet and those who have only 2G. So I have a few questions. In a world where half the population are not yet online, and with those who are even online, it's still not meaningful connectivity. In other words, be able to use the internet every day, have uh, uh, at least 4G speed, have uh, unlimited, wi or unlimited Wi-Fi at home or at school, and have the skill to, to use this. How many people can benefit, can access, co-create, and benefit from Web3. This is the reason the World Wide Web Foundation exists. You must have seen that hashtag that Sir Tim Berners-Lee put out during the London Olympics. Hashtag for everyone. If you forget every other thing I'm saying today, my question to Tom, to Clive, to Tamba is, is this for everyone? Will it be for everyone? Will it be for the rural woman in, in far away uh, Tango Benga in Cameroon? Will it be for the rural person in, in uh, Kurogo in Cote d'Ivoire? And then how do we ensure the security? The technology security is one thing, but the human induced insecurity is another thing. Because as long as a technology can be built by a person, it can be deconstructed by another person. We know that. I'm not saying that the, the layering, that I think that the, the, the people, the architecture part of it will come in, but the human nature is there. I'm going to speak to you now about one of the things that worries me the most, and that is online gender-based violence. Generally, violence online, violence in the digital space, abuse in the digital space. There is technology abuse, there is legal abuse, there is social abuse, there is language abuse. There's all, there are all kinds of violence on the platforms. Does Web3 or the technologies around Web3 
give any kind of guarantee that these can be addressed. My question is, can this, how do you format a human mind? Can we do that? Can Web3 do that? Because technology is one thing, human beings are another thing. Democracy, someone said, ah, I'm going to come back to that. Because as someone who lives in Africa, who has lived, whose parents lived through colonization, who is seeing the same patterns of digital colonization, I'm going to come back to this. But let me listen to the two experts. Please ping me on the, on the discussion. I, I'm coming for them. Let me stop now. Thank you, Nina. Those are some great questions. Um, and we'll be sure to get back to some of those later in the, in the conversation. Um, do we, let's go to Club next. Yes, thank you, Nana. I love everything that you said, and I'm going to try to answer them. And in my answer to this question, you know, I think I think one of the biggest issues is the fact that people don't realize this is the future frontier. We are at the point of architecture. You know, this thing is actually being built, right? So when you think about in the '90s when we debated the internet. We did not have these conversations, right? We did not, you know, have the conversations about accessibility, you know, non-technical users, digital literacy, digital divide, right? So we are having them now. But I, I do think one of our biggest challenges is how people define Web3, right? Everyone has a different definition for it. And so for me, it's, it's just that next iteration of the web, right? We're in web two right now, and we want to get to three, and we have tools like blockchain and cryptocurrency that offers us an opportunity for small contracts to create you know, peer to peer that enter engagements that are secure. We can layer in you know, cryptocurrencies to facilitate microtransactions. We can add in artificial intelligence, machine learning to create an immersive experience. We can actually create a marketplace and go to you know, potentially a metaverse, right? So right now, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of FOMO. It, there's not a clear definition. And I think that's fine. Decentralization is, you know, space where everybody does get to define. But what we won't, what we do not get to define is what that next iteration of the web should be. Right? Nana pointed out a lot of the problems that are part of web two right now. If we're going to move to a decentralized web, we should seek, seek to fix those problems. We should look at, you know, technology, all of the emerging technologies and how they can be leveraged to actually solve some of those issues. Also, you know, I, I think there's a unique opportunity that we didn't have in the 90s when we were looking at this, right? Right now, the adoption of blockchain and cryptocurrency globally is among people of color. The greatest adoptions we've seen are in countries where there's high inflation, where people don't trust the state, the central bank is not strong. Across the continent of Africa, where the average age is 21 to 24, huge adoption. And here in the US in its infancy, black and Latino communities lead national adoption. That's different than it was in the nineties. That will actually inform how we build. Even the marketplace is different here. It's intergenerational. Baby boomers have the greatest amount of the wealth right now. Gen X was like myself, we're, we're very critical to the marketplace, but we're a very small generation. Millennials, the largest generation since baby boomers, they created this sharing economy that has made crypto even the crypto marketplace even possible. And then Zoomers, those in high school and college who somehow have the most the greatest disposable income without having a job, you know, will inherit inherit the wealth. So we have to build for all these generations because they're part of this marketplace, right? So you will never hear me talk about the metaverse. I, I see that as one of the most vulnerable, vulnerable aspects of this conversation, because technically the only metaverse that actually exists is if in gaming. In gaming, they have created an alternate reality where people do live and interact, right? And right now what we've created with Decentraland and Sandbox and others, to me, it seems like a country club for centralized players. Right, we've seen Gucci, all of these traditional brands sell their products there. There's no conversation about inclusion there, right? Somebody paid 
I think $500,000 for the house next to Snoop, right? So, and, and that's fine, right? We, as we plan and as we iterate, you know, people are going to create stuff, but we should not move forward until we actually deal with these issues. And I think the, the, the imperative is, I think the, 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 the change that we have because the world is so diverse and so young, because we have to build for a much more inclusive population that I don't believe that we will, even with the metaverse the way it is right now, even, even beyond inclusion, the concept of privacy that crypto enjoys, who's collecting all this data? Where will it be maintained? So that said, I do think a decentralized web is possible. I think we're having the right conversations. I think we're 10 years out and that's a good thing. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of a lot of great points. Um, next, I'll go to Tamba. I don't know if I can follow up with this great speaker. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I, I'm going to talk from a practical standpoint uh, because I like building things and testing and experimenting. So first, when I hear the word Web3, I mean Web with the three together as one word, not web-3.0. I'm talking about web three, right? When I hear web three, it's more of a buzzword than a reality at this point in my head. It's also something that I consider a leading technology. Why I call it leading technology? Because only a few companies who, wants, who understands it are making attempt to build applications to run on it. And even people who are using it to some extent can be considered people who live on the edge of technology, who wants the brightest and the latest, right? So it's a leading technology from that standpoint. The buzzword, it's all over. If I was to look at my best case, right? My best case scenario will be a wall where individuals and organizations use technology to bridge gaps between the virtual and the physical right that's how i look at it virtual and physical in the sense in the physical world you have real money in the virtual world you're going to have tokenized money or or, or or cryptocurrency right there is a way to convert your real money into crypto there is a way to convert your crypto into real money and if i was to go into some metaverse i would be able to use my crypto money to buy something to subscribe to something that then reflects on my physical so by doing that, I have blended the two. I've closed the gap between the two. Now, that is good to me. It's, I'm optimistic about that future because I like to live on the edge from a technology standpoint. And uh, if you think about it from a training standpoint, from an event standpoint, even an event like this, we could be holding this event in a, in a, in a, in a metaverse where we can take a coffee break and actually go get a virtual coffee. We can take a game break and actually play a game and all that. So I'm optimistic about that. Where I'm pessimistic about this is how will this increase inclusion and diversity from a technology standpoint overall? Personally, based on my experience, I've been in this field for almost 20 years. This is not going to close the gap. I don't see Web3 as a technology that's going to close the gap that we have today when you think about how you call it, when you think about inclusion and diversity in the tech space. I actually think it's going to widen the gap more. And this will go back to uh, Nene's uh, point and questions, right? You said, is this for everyone? No. In my opinion, Web3 is not for everyone, right? So think about that pyramid that we still have. There is a top that's very small and there is a bottom that's very large. Web3 right now is a technology for that top. And I think it's still gonna be a technology for that top. That's just my personal opinion, right? And it's not gonna be able to, it's not gonna get to that bottom anytime easy, unless we, found a way, we find a way to get those basic things that you talked about electricity. How do we generate electricity outside the way we do it today? How do we make sure everyone is connected outside the way we do it today? If all of this blockchain technology and all of this web three technologies are able to accelerate or leapfrog those areas 
that actually keep the bottom of the 3 million at the bottom, then I will be hopeful that this will increase, will decrease the gap in the digital divide. So from a pessimistic, pessimistic standpoint, it will widen the gap. From an optimistic standpoint, it will make things a lot easier and fun for people at the top of that pyramid who are enjoying it today. They will continue to enjoy it and they will enjoy it a lot more than they do today. And I will stop there for now. Thank you. Um, so we have a lot of uh, different perspectives, it sounds like, from the, from the first question. Um, so I want to I wanna pick up on a theme that I think I heard in a few of the answers, which is, to what extent does Web3 solve the existing problems of the current web? And to what extent are these problems going to continue to exist in Web3 or, either, or even become more urgent in Web3, um, assuming assuming that Web3 adoption uh, continues to, to accelerate. Um, so in particular, I'm thinking of problems, uh, the types of things that we work on at the Web Foundation, things like um, data privacy rights, uh, things like the digital divide, connectivity and inclusion. Um, I'm curious uh, from sort of um, a couple of you that are, are more optimistic about Web3, how you see these issues uh, being Fixed or being addressed in a in a Web three context, um, as well as uh, as well as our panelists who are a bit more concerned about these things. So I will let you guys jump in um, as you as you see fit. I'll, I'll jump in. You know, this might sound class to someone, but if Web three, if crypto was a pregnant woman, her water has not broken yet. Right. So right now we're imagining. Is, is is that baby a boy or a girl? We're even envisioning where that baby will be when it gets to college, who it will marry, what his personality will be. So no, right? There's a pregnant woman out there who is near term, but we're 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 at the point of architecture, and and that's why we have we need policies that foster innovation. We need to iterate, and I'll and I'll reiterate what I said. Right, diversity is the change this time around. Even when the internet started becoming popular, it was an exclusive few. Right today, the greatest amount, the, the largest blocks of users are people of color, are global. Right. They were the last ones to get to. I remember when it's people over 50 became large users of, crypto, of, of the internet. So right now, one of the biggest problems we have is not that the internet is not popular, it's not that it's not, its potential is not great, it's the fact that it's controlled by four wealthy males, right? So we want to give control back to the users and those users have agency. They know what they want. And we should not assume that that if we give them an opportunity to be part of that conversation, that they won't assert, assert themselves, right? So I, I think the space is its in infancy. And I think we absolutely sh should have concerns. But I think decentralization is a game changer, right? Where we're, no, where we're not trying to create a centralized entity where there'll be the president, vice president, where small communities, small groups can actually create community and actually build and grow, leveraging things like decentralized autonomous organizations, right? People can actually create small contracts and you use this to create more immersive experience with the communities that they want to speak to. So, so, you know, I think we have to see where the space is going, even with the work of the World Wide Web Foundation. How long did it take to get here, right? When did, was this organization formed? Right? How did it really come to terms with who are, you know, what are those, some, those principles and how do we imp implement them globally? So right now, you know, the crypto space is barely a decade old. Web3 is part of that conversation. And I think we need the skeptics, we need Nana at the table. We need Tamba at the table. We need Tamika at the table. Because it's not about whether or not you think it's, it's good or bad. Its merits don't matter. The crypto is here and it's here for good, right? It's just a matter of how do we leverage it? And un unless we're intentional about non-technical users, about ensuring accessibility, intentional that we're not designing things that are biased, 
we, we will end up in the same place, but I don't believe that's where we'll be because this conversation wasn't happening with these people, with Tamika, who leads one of the most wealthiest companies in the crypto space, in the Web3 space, being here to actually have this conversation where a black woman like myself who comes from a public policy, public policy background, it has been in crypto for six years and who prides herself on being a contrarian in this space can actually you know, contribute and say, and actually create a pathway for people that I know are being left out. So I think that is the, that, that is the change. And you know what, Nana, you actually have my spirit is so intense right now because of her. <laughs> so your energy is very, very contag contagious. But I'm, but I I'll pass it on. But those are my thoughts in terms of let the space mature. So, uh, ben, was... if if I can just build a little bit on uh, Cleb's great comments there and and your very important question. I first got into this technology and started looking at it uh, in detail when I was serving as an advisor to the Secretary of State, and we were trying to figure out how to provide more individuals in the Global South with access to high quality digital services. And I was sitting down with the president of the country that has arguably done the best job uh, of building out digital infrastructure for their citizens, Estonia. Uh, and I was saying, how could we build the types of services that Estonia has and make them available to more people around the world? And he said, if we were to do that again today, we would build on blockchain. We would build on the decentralized foundations that are the core uh, of Web3. And, and that was really what intrigued me uh, about the opportunities in this realm. We are seeing already the potential for early versions of what is enabled through Web3 to solve really remarkable problems. So for example, if you look at what Kenya has achieved with digital payment systems, they've lifted 2% of their entire population out of poverty exclusively on the basis of having access to digital payments. Bangladesh, again, not a rich country, has saved the equivalent of two billion days of previously wasted time. And in the countries that are really getting this right, like Estonia, they recoup the equivalent of 2% of GDP. This is not just about small countries. It's not just about rich countries. Some of the most innovative thinking around how you build these systems is occurring in large, highly complex democracies like India uh, that are starting to line up new tools for digital identity with new tools for payments and data. We need to be thinking creatively about how these systems are going to evolve. And to the extent we do that in a way that preserves privacy and is consistent with our values, we will be successful in solving a lot of very important problems for a lot of people. Now, I would certainly agree with Tamba and Nana, there's no guarantee we're gonna get this right. And we need to be very honest about that. There are a lot of things that can go wrong uh, along the way. And so conversations like this are going to be essential in helping us hopefully to see around some of the corners, identify problems that could emerge and design systems in a way that are going to maximize their benefits for as many individuals as possible. Thank you, Tameka. I think, um... Tom Bell, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, so this is a very good point. Again, if I, I look at this from a, a couple of points, right? One is there is a, a, a set of people that believe that the decentralized web or web three will, for example, improve or solve security problems, right? Is that true? In my opinion, based on me using it, what's available today and looking at it from a technology architecture standpoint, no. In fact, if I was to advise a client and I was to put a rank from your, on your risk level, if you were using web three from a security standpoint, if I was to put five points with one being low risk and five being high risk, I will put anything you put on web three as five. It's high risk because it's bleeding edge. We don't know enough. We don't have enough examples, right? We don't even know enough about some of the people who are in the background of this technology. We have access to the source code, we're playing with it, 
But until more and more people use it, until more and more people have access to it, until more and more real use cases that solve everyday problems start coming into play, it's not solving the security problem. It just increases it to some extent because when I have too many unknowns from a security standpoint in the computer world, it's high risk for me. When I know more, then I can put a mitigation plan in place, then it's low risk. So that's the first part I'll put. Second part is privacy, right? In the decentralized world, uh, in, the, in the Web3, people argue again that you will have more privacy. Well, it depends from what perspective, right? And I'll give you an example. Let's say, for example, I am a journalist and I want to share some data with someone. I don't even want that person to know who I am. And I don't want that person to be able to even identify me. Or I just want to give them that information. Or possibly I just want to put that information on the decentralized web by creating my own decentralized website that is copied all over the place that no government can even put down, right? The amount of money and time that it's going to take me to do that today, it quadruples what I will do using any of the Web2 technologies, right? So that means it's not even accessible to everyone. It's still going to be accessible to a few of the rich. I have that as an example. If you want to send me crypto, I can send you my URL, and my URL ends with ETA, right? You don't have to memorize that long hash, right? But in order for me to get that URL, I need to identify myself to the Ethereum domain name service. Once that information is collected from me by the Ethereum domain name service, I don't know how they're going to use it. The same trust factors that I will have today with ICANN or any domain registrar, I will have the exact same trust factors with them because if for whatever reason, for whatever legal reason, government is to go in and say, I want to know who owns this domain, trust me, they will get the information because they collected it from me. It doesn't matter where they store it or how they store it. So in essence, even the decentralized web as it is today, you still have to identify yourself and there are still centralized organizations and centralized nodes that are being used. Unless you have a bunch of friends who are in the same centralized world, who have their own computers or nodes at home, who can pin your decentralized content at home, and it's not sitting in any organization, then you are not truly decentralized. That's the reality today on where we are now. Will that change in the future? Definitely, it's very possible it's going to change in the future. And we are learning in the process to get it right so that we can hopefully get to that promise of a truly decentralized web where you have control, I can tell you here, take it. And if I want to take it back from you, I take it. You cannot save it or what. So I will stop there and I'll allow uh, others to speak. I want to challenge the, the control part of it. Um, I, I know that I think it's, it's like a mirage that is given to, to, to users. I mean, I'm speaking as a user now, right? I actually have a Bitcoin account. <laughs> um, and when I went to register, first of all, I found that everything is being quoted in US dollars. Is, is there someone else who's had a different experience? And then when I get to open account and, and put money trade and up and down, I'm, I'm, I'm required to use my card to, to kick off stock. That's going to be either MasterCard or Visa. Once again, I live in West Africa. There is something we say in the financial world that flow follows flow. If you can close your eyes for a minute and try to map the big um, international uh, air traffic hubs in the world, you are going to be mapping Singapore, Shanghai, New York, San Francisco, Paris, London. You, you have those places. And flying from one, from San Francisco to New York, or New York to Paris is very cheap, okay? And because that is where uh, traffic, heavy traffic is, and it makes things cheaper. And so it's easier for you to do that. Now, close your eyes and map the global finance hubs in the world. Now try to overlay the, that global financial hub map on the global uh, air traffic hub you will find that they kind of 
over each other. In other words, the places of power will remain the places of power. I'm, I'm being told that I have a kind of control, but I'm in West Africa and I have to do my trading in USD and I have to do it on visa. And I have to, I have to do the things. It's like the, the offline world is coming online. It's the same uh, difficulties I have. I, um, I, Clem, I love, I love the pregnant woman thing because both of ourselves can relate. Maybe the guys can relate. But I like to give you another, another thing. I'm a, I'm a frequent traveler. Let's say, for instance, where, where um, the Sky Team uh, group is slashing their, their, their prices and say like, oh, we want everyone to travel, so we 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 buy buy two tickets, get one free, and then you can travel across the whole world. Of what use is that to someone who doesn't own a passport? Of what use is that to someone who can get a visa? That's my, my first question. How, how, how do we break it down? Because we're talking about uh, uh, rolling out digital services for people who are in, in places like myself. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. It's not there yet. Maybe we will get there. Maybe Web3 will help us get there, but I don't think we are there yet. I have another, another thing. Uh, governments, oh, by the way, I live in French speaking West Africa. We don't have a sovereign currency. Our currency is linked to the old French francs, which is linked to the Euro. So I am a West African and there is no currency, there's no financial, no current, current monetary sub sovereignty, by the way. I'm just saying so you know. So here am I, and I'm doing all of this, and my currency and its value is tied to the old French francs, which is tied to the euro. I'm saying all of this so you can understand me. Now, what is the role of our government? In the, the West African uh, French speaking or French money, money, um, monetary union, they are banning cryptocurrency. They're like, we don't understand this because there is very little power in the hands of government to be able to give users the necessary digital security that they need if anything goes wrong. And that comes to my last point, legal rescue and justice. Where can I sue if, if um, my money gets missing or someone says, oh, you've traded and it's gone wrong or something like that? Do I even have the capacity to litigate from this side of the world? And by the way, justice, what does it even mean for, for, pe for people who are poor, who don't have the skills, who can't afford lawyers? I mean, Black Americans, what does justice mean for them? Is that linked to democracy? What does someone just bombarded us with uh, yellow and blue? Did you see that? What we are living in a world of war, and it is a world where the the the, flock, the hubs decide who is democratic and who is not. Excuse me. And so the the the, the, the invention of Sir Tim Berners Lee is is not to be confounded. It's not to be to be compromised with hype. Right? Let, let's, let's still come back to the vision of the World Wide Web, that everyone will be able to access it, that everyone will be able to co-create, that everyone will be able to contribute, and that everyone will be able to benefit. As such today, while the war in Ukraine and, and, and Russia is going on, where we wake up every day and hear about NATO, where we wake up every day and hear about injustice, I don't think Web3 can do much. Well, it can, can do I, a bit, but it has to do more. Nana, can I respond that. on that? Because you're raising some really important points and I want to tackle them. Um, so in, in two oh, I want to go, go next after you. I would like, I, I would like you guys to respond. Um, we do want to get to audience questions. So uh, after uh, after you two respond, we will, we will get on to audience questions. Thanks. So just quickly, Nana, in 2008, I was working for Joe Biden uh, when the Russians invaded uh, Georgia. And the two of us got on a plane and we flew to Tbilisi. And we met with the leadership there. And while Joe Biden and I were on our way home from that trip, we tried to come up with a plan to help the people of Georgia, who you know, at that time, their capital was ringed with uh, Russian tanks, uh, and they were having a pretty tough go of it. 
And what we found is that it was going to be very, very difficult to move resources into that country to support those people. It was going to be very difficult uh, to document a lot of the atrocities that were happening. Uh, they were going to have a rough time of it, and they did have a rough time of it. And we helped them, but it wasn't simple. Let's contrast that to what we see going on in Ukraine right now, where the government came out and said, we need help. Uh, as the invasion was unfolding, they appealed to the world uh, for assistance uh, to respond to the invasion. And within days, they had raised almost $200 million using digital assets that people were able to send all over the world directly to them. And then we have the capacity using blockchain to have visibility into how those resources are being spent. So people have a lot more confidence in how the money is actually being spent. We also have tools like Arweave, which is being used to document in real time a permanent record of the atrocities that are being committed. So when it comes to providing a democratized platform for responding to these crises, when it comes to ensuring much higher levels of accountability and transparency, and if you look at the things that are really the killers of opportunity and democracy in our world today, it's corruption. When it comes to creating solid chains of evidence and ownership that we can use to validate the information that we need to rely on in our lives, Web3 has some really important solutions. We are not living in a vacuum, these solutions are not being deployed into a vacuum. We need to look at the failings of the status quo. And the reality is we've got some very big problems with our existing systems. And Web3 has at least a toolbox that enables us to respond effectively to a number of those challenges. That's what we should be focusing on. And, and hopefully that's where we're going to be able to go uh, in, in this conversation and others. Excellent points, Tamika. And I want to respond to Nana and, and Tamba's remarks because I think it's important for us to put crypto or Web3, whatever we want to call it, in context. The greatest adoption is already happening among Black and brown people. Like India, continent, the entire continent of Africa, the Caribbean, Latin America, right? So the ship, the ship has sailed, right? You know, the least amount of adaption is happening among Caucasians, right? And the wealthy, right? Unless it's like people just accumulating Bitcoin. So we have to put into context that the masses, the grassroots is already embracing this, right? So the, the, the goal we have here is how do we make it inclusive? And, it, and a lot of the challenges that you raised, Nana, have come because of regulation, because in the US specifically, we have to comply with, you know, know your customer laws, anti laundering laws. So blockchain exchanges have had to collect a lot more information, private information than we'd like, even after the infrastructure bill, you know, and, and this whole piece about, you know, expanding the definition of broker that would actually force, you know, black and Latino software and hardware developers, Black and Latino miners and stakers to actually function like exchanges, like Kraken, right? like Binance US. They don't have the capacity to comply in that way. So these are the growing pains we're, we're addressing in terms of how, as we look lay on leg, legislation and regulation, right? then when we actually go into the marketplace. So these are the kinks we have to fix right now. And I love Tamika's you know, example about Ukraine, because it actually showed the level playing field that that crypto can provide, not for governments, but for the people, right? You, typically, what would happen in the instance of Ukraine, people would become refugees, displaced because they can no longer have access to money, and they have no access to resources. And the amount of money sent to direct people has been incredible. Even CNBC did a story where they wanted to test, you know, how quickly payments can happen via, via crypto. And they actually sent money to a, a, a displaced, you know, Ukrainian who was living in Poland. I think they sent her 50 bucks via the, via the lightning, the Bitcoin lightning network. It, it got to her in two minutes. These are just small examples, but, 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 I don't believe we we no long, I don't believe we we get to debate the merits of crypto anymore. I think we now have to be 
into, into the conversation about the infrastructure, right? Because that growth among black and brown people globally will dominate this industry. And we need to shift conversation in terms of how do we ensure greater accessibility, closer the digital divide. And on the digital divide, the, the, my, Micah mentioned, sorry, to Micah mentioned M-Pesa in Kenya. 15 years later, the most successful digital currency in the world, that's not even based on cryptography, right? We know now that the, 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 the mobile phone is that access point. Let's get it into them. We need alternative, I, electricity and energy options so people can actually power their, 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 their devices themselves. But we have examples and we have a blueprint. We now have to focus on making sure everybody has a voice in regulation, in product development, in building. Sorry, I'm Please. done. <laughs> no, thank you. Those are, those are all excellent uh, points. Um, I do want to move to some audience questions and I'm hoping to get a couple in. We're, we're running pretty low on time, but uh, if you have answers, um, some, some good uh, succinct answers would be awesome for these. Um, so one question here that I see in the chat uh, from Morton Rand Hendrickson, and apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name. How does meaningful regulation work in a space that is decentralized and global? I'm happy to okay. jump in on that if nobody else wants it. But uh, you know, we, we see a really critical need for regulation uh, in this space. And these are technologies that are frankly only going to reach their full potential if we do have uh, thoughtful regulatory architecture uh, that can support them. Uh, there are a couple of key elements in regulatory frameworks that we think are going to be really important. The first is we need to begin by thinking of these tools not as some offshoot of the financial system, but really as the next generation of the internet. And too much of the conversation to date has been focused on very narrow esoteric questions around whether different types of tokens qualify as securities under regulatory frameworks that date to the Great Depression. We need to be a little bit more expansive and forward looking. Uh, this is like trying to regulate the internet uh, with the same framework that was developed for ham radios, which is actually what happened uh, in 1997. The FCC wanted to use those old uh, rules uh, and somebody at the White House uh, eventually came along and said, you know what, these are new tools, we need new rules. We need to have a, a similar conversation right now uh, around Web3. Uh, the only other uh, point I would say on this is we really need to begin by putting inclusion at the center of this conversation. Uh, and we need to think about the failings in our existing systems, which are myriad, uh, the billions of people who don't have access to good services, either financially or digitally uh, in the world, uh, and design in ways that it will bring everybody along. If we do that, we're going to see some really powerful outcomes. So I'll, I'll jump in. I want to jump in quickly to just make a point so I don't forget. And that point has to do with, uh, I'll call it the hype. So I've been hearing a lot about the promises of the blockchain, what we, what's already happening, the Ukraine use case and the other cases in Africa. But let me just bring uh, this point up, right? When we, I mean, when I, for example, like uh, Nana is talking about Blacks or it's talking about minorities or talking about inclusion and diversity, while the example in America or Latin America is great, the example in the African continent is the greatest, right? Because that's here where you have majority of the black people. Even if all the black people in America and Latin America get access, it still doesn't get anywhere close to closing the gap for Africans who live in Africa, right? Who have the real infrastructural problem. If you use the example of MPESA, it started way before blockchain, right? It was using simple SMS, US, USD type of uh, technology, right? These are phones that are already available all over the world. In, in some African countries, in fact, access to these type of phones, it's way higher than access to food. There are people who have those phones to make those calls, but they have no food to eat, right? They will take their money that they're supposed to eat and go spend it to pay to charge those phones, right? So those type of technologies will definitely work if it gets to the phone. But also when you hear about technologies, especially implemented in Africa, in African countries, unless you are a technologist and you have a way 
to get into the head of some of these companies that publish this information that we did this, we did this, and you are able to verify it. I will tell you based on the examples I've gone to, don't trust it, right? A case, case point is in Sierra Leone 2018. There is a company, I don't wanna call the name, that made it on the blockchain wall and made an announcement that Sierra Leone has just run the first blockchain based elections. That was 100% false. It made the news all over the world, right? I personally, as a Sierra Leonean, who was also involved in making that election transparent, had to basically jump in online, follow that company everywhere they are online and debunk that statement, right? These are the type of examples we see and that make us sometimes believe without looking under the hood that it's happening, but there is more marketing to it than what's happening. So I am pessimistic from that standpoint, but can all this solve some of the problems? Yes. For diversity and inclusion, I still believe it's not gonna be an easy one. And from a regulatory standpoint, who regulates the regulator, right? The government regulates, right? Who regulates the government? Are we gonna get rid of government completely, right? How will the government set up policies or regulatory systems that don't put them in control. The moment government sets it, it puts them in control. And the moment they are in control, some company or someone is gonna be in control. And the moment that somebody or that some company is in control, you really don't have complete control. That's what I believe from a technology standpoint. And that's what I believe based on what I see. I might be wrong, but I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. Well well, Tamba, there is no right or wrong, right? Just like there's no one size fit all, especially when it comes to regulatory policy, right? So every nation has to think about this in terms of policies for Web3, for crypto, and they have to think about it based on their constituency. We, you know, I've been working with the Blockchain Association for three years, and we work with Congress, with Washington, with regulatory agencies, you know, to try to figure this out, and it's tough. But crypto is borderless, right? We need, you know, we need nations to figure out what's best for them. And we also need them to also have some consistency because crypto is borderless. The IMF is having these conversations. The G7 is having these conversations. But, but, but what we don't know, what we don't see is small nations are having this, this conversation too. I'm Haitian American and the Haitian government, Haiti is always looked upon as the poorest nation in the world, which is not. Right? It may be the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere, which is the wealthiest hemisphere in the world. But Haiti, for the last four years, the central bank has been talking about a central bank digital currency for Haiti. They've put out an RFP. They have proposals for companies. They've actually been building their fintech infrastructure to actually facilitate that. I just did a, a presentation with the embassy of Haiti in the US where the, central, the Haiti Central Bank presented their findings and how to actually move forward to this. We underestimate the world and the people of the world. Right? They are having these conversations at a micro level. And, you know, I, you know, I, I love being part of this conversation, but let's be clear. The people who will really, really define this space are millennials and Zoomers. And they're much more open to decentralization. For those of us, again, I'm a Gen Xer, we have to shift our focus to putting together foundations and blueprints that they can actually use to build on. Like we should absolutely be asking the tough questions. Reg regulation is a concern to me because just like in the US, right? There is not in the US, there's not alignment with our regulators and our in, our in Congress, right? So when you don't have that level of alliance, all you have is uncertainty and an uncertainty hurts innovation, right? The President Biden put out a, 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 an executive order on cryptocurrency that focuses on let's get the data, let's do an analysis. I'm sure tons of nations are doing this. I think we have to create opportunities and we have to be better stewards of the future and really focus on creating a blueprint that young people can use 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Thanks, Clev. Uh, so we're 
a little bit over time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, that being said, Nena is the only one that didn't get to jump in on this question. I don't know if you have some some last words on this uh, this question, Nena. Oh, so I said very, very excited, which is the same as what Tim Benesley got as feedback from his uh, supervisor when he presented the web, uh, project. So there, Tomeka, Tamba, and Clay, we have a big work to do. Um, I think it's big. I think it's exciting. I think it's risky, but let's not be afraid. And that's why uh, folks who are online and folks who are going to watch this, uh, at the World Wide Web Foundation, we want to hear more. We want to listen, experiences, problems, risk, whatever you have, please let us know. We are the legacy holders of the vision of the World Wide Web. And what we want to do is to be at the service of the digital community. Thank you so very much for coming. Thank you, everyone. I want to give such a big thank you to all of the panelists. I thought this was a fantastic conversation. I thought you all had different but uh, exciting perspectives. Uh, and I wanna thank everyone that's that's watching along. Um, we will be continuing to work on uh, these policy issues. Um, I'm sure I'll stay in touch with each of the panelists. Um, and but for anyone that's watching, if you have thoughts uh, and you wanna reach out to the Web Foundation on these issues, um, your input and your perspective would be greatly appreciated. Uh, so thank you all. <laughs>